here. <clears throat> All right. So, just uh, keeping our course objectives in mind. Hopefully, when we walk out of here every day, we could say that we have increased our knowledge and love of God, that we have, in fact, promoted unity and fellowship of believers in what we're doing here, and we have some idea about how we can help people understand the, the truth of the gospel as we think about these interactions between science and faith. And again, we're finding ourselves residing here, thinking about how has what God shown us in nature, informing our theology, and also what has God shown in his word that informs our science. And hopefully, while there's potential conflict there, if things are the way they ought to be, there shouldn't be any. They should agree with each other. And just reminding ourselves again what science is, or we talked about science is not quite as solid as a thing as we might think. Uh, so this is kind of a, a working definition, but we're thinking that science, and, and this is as opposed to technology. They're interrelated, but when we're thinking of science, we're thinking about how do we explain the natural world? is what we're thinking about, and how do we go about doing that. So from last week, remember last week, we were kind of taking a look at what, what happened in the pre-Christian era in terms of the ancients, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Greeks. And so we saw a couple things. One is that the, they didn't get very far as far as science goes. Lots of technology was there, and they certainly laid some foundations for modern scientists. Certainly did that. But they didn't get very far. And the reason, what I contended last time, was it had a lot to do with their theology. That they viewed God as being very distant and unknowable, and, but that same God is the one who's controlling and running the world, running the universe. And if God's unpredictable, then so is the world. And if the world's unpredictable, then there's really no reason to try and explain how the world works. No science. The other thing we saw is that when we think about what's written in the creation passages in the Old Testament, that a lot of them stood in contrast to what was going on in the cultures surrounding them. So they wrote in a way, and they wrote about things to be um, contradictory to the prevailing cultures. And then we also took a little bit of a look at the passages in the Old Testament that have some language that makes us think that they're subscribing to some kind of Babylonian cosmology, when really we don't need to make that kind of commitment that they're using phraseology that really isn't scientific, it's poetic. And we use some of those same kind of terms today. We say, he went to the ends of the earth. Really, did he really, do we still think that there is an end of the earth and someone's gonna fall off? But we say that, or you know, this, this message was spread to the four corners of the earth. Do we really think that the earth has four corners? No, we don't. But we, that's still embedded in our language today. and We understand what that means. And so the same thing can be said of what we see in the Old Testament. So now, today what I want to try and do, and this is maybe, I don't know, a big task for an hour here. But we want to take a look at how did Christianity, or what effect did Christianity have on the science in the Christian era? And I want to put a little plug for this. Um, I'm not basing this entirely, but I thought this was really, really interesting. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with J. Warner Wallace. His Probably the book most of people are familiar with is, is his Cold Case Christianity. 
Uh, Jay Warner Wallace is a forensic scientist. He works in the LA Police Department. He's been on, what's the show, Dateline or something like that. He regularly appears as an expert in forensics. And as an atheist, he wanted to test out the testimony of the Bible against good witness quality. And as he looked at what was in the Gospels and sized things up, he said, the testimony that's given in the New Testament would be judged to be a reliable witness. And so he does a lot. So he, find, he looking at the Gospel record, it, it compelled him to put his faith in Jesus. And so he is now a Christian apologist. And so this is his latest book. It, this is like hot off the presses. I just I, I did a pre-order, and it came in the mail two weeks ago. So this is brand new. So the title is Person of Interest, and his idea here, and it's kind of like text slash graphic novel is what he's tried to do here. But it's taking the subtitle is Why Jesus Still Matters in a World that Rejects the Bible. Okay? So, okay, so let's set the Bible to the side here. Did Jesus have an impact in our world? And if he did, how do you account for that? How, how could this one person have this much impact in the world if he was just a person? He was really good at marketing and branding. Exactly, exactly. He was at the forefront. Yes. So one of his chapters in here is about science. And so not, not to keep you from buying the book, but uh, so he makes, he makes um, several claims here in this regard. So keep in mind what we're thinking here. Is that there, is, there really is this inordinate effect of Christianity. And so one of the things we look is just in terms of the timeline for science, when does the exponential growth of science begin? And if you look at the timeline for the growth of science, Jesus is positioned right at the beginning of that. And then he takes a look at the whole Christian era. And that's actually what I'm going to try and do today. So he was kind of like, Thoughts after my own thoughts. We're going to take a, like a quick survey <coughs> through the history of science today. And, but when we look at every single era, there were Christians at the forefront in every era. And he also kind of does this breakdown of, you know, when we say, oh, so-and-so is the father of this, so-and-so is the father of that. Well, he has this really, really long list of all the fathers of this kind of science. Every single one, you know, everyone that he lists, they're all Christians. And then he also takes a look at all the different awards that are given for scientists. And he just looks at, there were Christians who received this, all of these awards at some point in time. And specifically, we'll, we'll talk about this as well, taking a look at just one of those prizes is the Nobel Prize. What percentage of you know, Christians receive that? Well, in an unsurprising unsur uh, number of Christians, proportion of Christians, have received this award. And so the question, is this just coincidence? Or how do we account for that? So that's kind of what he, he goes there. Well, let me just show you something really quick here. So, with this book, and this is becoming more and more common, especially for nonfiction books, is that not only do you buy the paper book, but they make all kinds of stuff available online, which is incredible. And so, this one relates to just this chapter nine here. Oops. It's a beautiful book. You like that? Why is this? Oh. You have to drag it. Yeah. Let's see if we can't. Come on. Well, I don't know if we can put a little 
let me drag it over. It's not letting me drag it over. Well, okay, I'll forego that. I won't waste time fiddling with the technology. But, uh, I mean, it's like a 200-page document. And what he does in this document is he just lists all of these scientists and what they did and, and just, just like a sentence description of what they did and what they were involved in. And it's just hundreds and hundreds of pages of, of different scientists who were involved in science at the forefront of science. So the first thing I want to do, I think, oh, at least a word needs to be said about what happened in the Arab world. Because the Arabs actually make a pretty big splash on the scene. Now, when I say Arabs, we're, we're talking about Muslim, people of Muslim faith. We, they are people of the book. They do believe in the Old Testament. They believe in a monotheistic God. And they made a lot of headway in terms of astronomy. They came up with excellent tools for recording um, where the positions of stars and planets and things were and thought a lot about the models for astronomy. Um, and they had an educational system, uh, but different than, than we're accustomed to. In the Arab world, the educational system was a mentorship program. So it was not centralized. It was very decentralized. And there was just like this network of scholars that you would tap into if you were of the scholarly type. And so if you wanted to study astronomy, well, my uncle so-and-so is an expert in that. And so you would go live with that scholar for a time and be mentored by them. And then maybe if, okay, they told you all that you wanted to know from then, then maybe you would go over to another town somewhere else where there was another <clears throat> scholar that you wanted to sit under. So it was very scattered, very decentralized. But several things came into play that completely disrupted uh, this progress of science in the Arab world. One is geopolitical. What, what happened in Persia that upset things? That took them out of the limelight as far as history is concerned? What was the big event? It was the Mongol invasion, okay? So the Mongols came in and they disrupted everything. So all of the organized government and everything that they had was disrupted. And they broke into real tribal factions. So this whole idea of being networked and cooperating together got disrupted. There was economic disruption. What was funding all the science in the Arab world? Trade with the East, the Silk Road. Remember the Silk Road. What would happen to the Silk Road? Huh? They got shut down. Why? What? 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 What shut down the Silk Road? Huh? Religious values. Not entirely. There was something a little bit more. A little bit more uh, definitive, let's say. Because it's economic. Does it cost a lot of money to haul stuff on camels across uh, Asia from China into the shipping? Yes, it was shipping. <clears throat> when the boat sailed, the Silk Road ended. So between the Mongols and sailing ships, the Silk Road ended. And so the cash cow for Persia came to a fast halt. So they weren't funded. 
but probably more so was theological. Because in Muslim theology, more and more, God became understood as very capricious. We think about God as being a sovereign God. God's in control of everything. But we say that in somewhat of an offhanded way. I don't think that God was in control at all of the coffee in my cup here. I had some control in that matter. Not in Islam. God is in control of everything. And not just the present, but the past. If he wants to, he can go back and alter the past to make things happen the way he wants them to happen which I don't know how they figure that out. How did you detect that? I don't, that's a weird thing. That's like that time travel kind of thing, right? So, but the point though is, God's unknowable. It's, it's un, the world is unpredictable, and if the world is unpredictable, then there is no point in doing science. So for a lot of reasons, the advances that were made in the Arab world, which were many, come to a standstill. Now, they become useful for the Christians. We'll talk about that in a minute. So it, it wasn't a complete loss, but it does come to an end there. So that kind of brings us into the medieval world. So we're talking, you know, beginning in 500. Not much to speak about before then, because what's happening in the Christian world in the first 500 years? Okay, so disintegration of the Roman Empire, that's falling apart. Christianity is still small scale. The church is just, the church and theology are just getting grounded. They're busy fighting doctrinal heresies and things like that. And so we don't see a lot in terms of science going on prior to the Middle Ages. But the Middle Ages, to be clear, were not the Dark Ages. This is a term that gets thrown around. Where did that term come from? Anyone know? Why do, why do people refer to the medieval period as the Dark Ages? Huh? Well, actually, the plague kind of ends the Dark Ages. The plague came around the 1400s, which is kind of at the end of it. So what about all that time before? Why, was it, why is it referred to as the Dark Ages? Well, there's a gap in the history. For a while, there was a lot of that history was just secret away, and people didn't know a lot of what was going on at that time. So, Well, and see, and that's, kind of, that's the narrative we're given, but that's not true. That's not true. I Well, right? So here's the thing. It's not because nothing was going on or they were backwards or anything. This, is, this was pejorative language put out by Enlightenment scholars. Okay? And we are, we're not going to get into the Enlightenment today. But in the Enlightenment, they were of the belief that the mind was going to figure out everything. And so they had to set in contrast the people who came before them because it was so based on Christian thought and Christian theology. And they wanted to contend these people were in the dark. They were not enlightened like we are. Therefore, it was the dark ages. Okay, But it really wasn't. And so um, Alfred... North Whitehead wrote this. He said, The origin of science came from the medieval insistence on the rationality of God, conceived as with the personal energy of Jehovah and with the rationality of a Greek philosopher. Every detail was supervised, so everything in the world was supervised and ordered. The search into nature could only result in the vindication of the faith in rationality. Okay? So this, is, this was an ideal that was upheld by medieval scholars, that we do have a mind that is, and these are some of the philosophical things that we talked about a while ago, 
that there is, we can have faith in reason, in what we see in the world, and then therefore we can do science. So in, those, in the early part of the Middle Ages, one of the things that was really important was the development of the monastic system. So we have monasteries set up and the monks are gathering together. And what are they doing in those monasteries? Well, they're not just hiding away. They are doing things to help and advance their communities. Everything that they did in a monastery was for the betterment of the community. They wanted to be self-sufficient, but also provide things for the community, economically, uh, and to help out poor people. And so they were really good at developing agriculture, because not only were they, they, they wanted to be self-sustaining, but they also wanted to be providing goods and services for people in their community. So they had to do good agriculture. They also were good at developing medicine and, and caring for the sick. And one of the primary things was they developed education systems. And I think it's been said, you know, when we look at the history of the church, wherever the church goes, education goes. And this is huge in terms of, of developing learning systems and ways for people to interact and exchange ideas. So I'll, I'll throw out one guy, I don't know if you ever heard of this guy, the Venerable Beatty or Beatty the Venerable. So he was a monk, and, but he covered a lot of ground. He wrote a lot of biblical commentaries, so he was a, definitely was a theologian. He was a historian. He was one of the first people who started recording the history of England. So we do know a lot of history because people thought about writing these things down. But he was also interested in the natural world. And he developed a system, it was like this two-volume book, a system to help people figure out how to calculate important dates on the Christian. Like when is Easter? How do you figure out when Easter is? Right? Um, and his book was actually then used for centuries in the European universities. It was landmark. So he was really, really important as a scholar. Then in the, what we call the High Middle Ages, from 1000 to 1300, this is when the university systems begin to be developed. So we're thinking the very first ones were in Italy, but also in France, England. So we think about Oxford and Cambridge. Oxford and Cambridge started in, in 1100. You think about that. Wow. You know, that school's been around for a thousand years. You know, that's impressive. And, but the thing is, uh, those universities are, were not state universities. They were sponsored by the church. But they had, the church had a very interesting relationship with the universities. They were a little bit on the hands-off side. They said, we understand that education is important and that people need to develop their minds to understand the things of God, and so we want you guys to do that. And theology was, was only a very small part of the curriculum. It wasn't the dominating thing in the curriculum. It was, some place, it was a place you would go to become a pastor or something, but everyone who went to the university didn't follow that track. Um, this was a place where all of the classical literature got rediscovered in a sense. Because it had to be translated. It was written in Greek, it was written in Arabic. And so in the universities, they translated all these things into Latin. So all those Arab texts that I mentioned before got translated and were used in the universities. So that knowledge got carried forward. Plus you think about all the interaction that happens in a centralized educational system where not only the professors, but the students had the ability to interact and exchange ideas. Uh, Aristotle, his writings were expansive. And every part of the university curriculum kind of began with Aristotle. But Aristotle very quickly began to be challenged in the university system. So even though 
it was the beginning of your instruction. It was not the end of your instruction. Um, and so there was a lot of debate and talk about, okay, here's what Aristotle said, you know, is that true? Is that right? Um, and one of the things that happened here was uh, there was a lot of exploration of what we call secondary causes. Apart from, you know, pre-Christian thinking and, and Arab thinking where God is kind of running everything, is controlling the movement of everything, we're thinking now this is not the case. God instantiated everything, but he allowed there to be laws and the thing called cause and effect that could help us explain what's going on in the world. And so this was very much in their minds. So this guy, Averro, he was, he was actually um, Persian, but he did a lot of his own work in astronomy and cosmology, but he also wrote a lot of commentaries on Aristotle. So not only did they study Aristotle, in the university, they studied Averro because he had a lot to say about critiquing what Aristotle said. Roger Bacon, now don't be confused with Francis Bacon, he's a little later on, but Roger Bacon was a Franciscan friar, and he was very formative in kind of using mathematics in helping us to describe and understand what's going on in the world. And also, one of the beginners of thinking about experimentation. Not just Aristotle, what Aristotle did was he would sit in his room, look out the window, and think, well, so I see this thing happening, and this is why it's happening. And he wrote it down. And everyone just took his word for it, because, well, he thought about it. And this was, this was the approach to science, is that it was, an, it was an operation of the mind alone, and we didn't bother to go out and test anything. Um, and then Thomas Aquinas, I think, is probably a familiar name, that he thought a lot about how philosophically, um, how we think about the natural order and how God fits into that as well. Then in the late Middle Ages, we have guys like William Ockham. You've probably heard of Ockham's Razor. So we're thinking now about, okay, how do we evaluate science? We've got two theories for the same observation. How do we decide which theory is the best theory? Well, so Occam's razor says the simplest. Now, here's the thing, though. Is that true? No. Uh, that was a suggestion. One way to kind of weigh out which theory is a better theory? Let's go with a simpler idea, which has some merit to it, but that's an axiom. There's, there's nothing that helps you verify that and say, this is, this is the, that is the way you decide. But it's a, it's a way that we can weigh out theories. But the point is, we're thinking about that. We're judging our ability to make expla explanations. Uh, Nicole Lorraine, he was, uh, the thing I like about him is, is he starts thinking about statistical analysis. He's the guy who starts doing graphing to help us understand patterns and relationships in nature. And then, of course, I had to throw this guy in here, uh, Gutenberg. He's the guy who starts the printing press. Now things become really explosive because now not only are ideas exchanged in the university, they're now exchanged in the marketplace because you can print off pamphlets and books and things like that. So here's a good indicator then. Yeah? Uh, uh, I hate to be on the subject, but can you tell us why uh, Aristotle thought that the Middle Ages? Because middle, does that, does that mean that there's an early age and a late age? Or? Why did they call it I, you know, this is up to the historians to make these arbitrary determinations. <laughs> so, I, you know, I think we've got the classics, the ancients, and we've got the moderns, which actually begins, modern, it begins in the 1500s. 
And so the medieval period is in between the modern era and the classics. So, so that's why middle, in between. So, so here's an interesting graph, speaking of Barbaran. So this is, this is a graph showing how many manuscripts were produced over these different centuries. And you see what's happening here. So in the 6th, 7th, 8th centuries, nothing's going on, right? But here the university system begins. And what happens? It's exponential growth. Exponential growth. And this is where we see science really taking off. This is just kind of a dipstick measure of what's happening in science. And then we progress further. Now notice what they've done here. So this is still the 6th to the 15th century. Where did that exponential curve go? Oh, it's here. This is a logarithmic scale. So notice what's happening with the numbers here. 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, million, 10 million. This is an exponential scale. So we use uh, log graphing to straighten out exponential curves. So that's what's happened here. So we've straightened out the exponential curve that we saw here, right? So we've now just straightened that out. But here's Gutenberg in his press, right here. And what happens? It, it's even more. If you take a look at the slope here versus the slope here, it's exponential and then some is what's going on. So I want to take some time real quick. This is fast. We're going to go through 400 years in 20 minutes. You ready? <laughs> He's good. Uh, so in the modern era, what's going on in the modern era? And here's what I want to think. I'm just going to take like a, a quick snapshot uh, and just kind of run a sequence through timeline, just looking at individuals. But the thought here is, how is Christianity influencing science? And how is science influencing Christianity? Is there, is there this connection between them? So, we think about this guy, Nicholas Copernicus. He's a standout guy because he puts something down somewhat unique. He writes about a heliocentric solar system, which is way off the thought of the day. Now, he did not originate this idea. He actually drew on some Greek thinkers that came some time before him. But they never, they never could go anywhere with it. They didn't have any way to substantiate it. What he did was he put a math to it. So he was a mathematician as well as an astronomer. And so in his principles, he came up with some good mathematical reasons why we should think the planets are going around the sun and not everything going around the earth. Um, and a lot of it had to do with, he understood the math of it, he understood, for instance, distances. If, if Mars really is going around the Earth every 24 hours, how fast would it have to be going? He's like, it would be going so fast, it would just tear everything apart. This, this just cannot be. It can't be going that fast. So he really put the math to it. And so he says this, the universe has been wrought for us by a supremely good and orderly creator. He really is thinking about that. He's making that connection. To know the mighty works of God, to comprehend his wisdom and majesty and power, to appreciate and degree the wonderful workings of his laws, surely all of this must be a pleasing and acceptable mode of worship to the Most High. Which is interesting. So these, particularly these early guys, they did not separate their vocational life and their devotional life. They saw them as being intertwined. And then we have Galileo. Now Galileo, of course, is this 
really interesting figure in history because he's often held up as this picture of the conflict between science and religion. And actually, it's a great deal more nuanced than that. What often gets told in history books was, or what some people remember from their public education is what the Enlightenment thinkers wanted to put out. And the, the, there were 19th century historians that really altered the narrative about the story about what happened with Galileo. Now, Galileo did get himself in trouble. But it wasn't because of what he was proposing about the universe, that it was a heliocentric universe. That's not what he got in trouble for. He got in trouble because he was a cantankerous man who didn't get along well with people. And he was really good at upsetting people. He lost university posts in the physics department because he was telling off the other professors who had been there before him. He, he just was not a good diplomat. Uh, so he upset a lot of people. And when he was, he, the, the Pope entertained Galileo a lot. Galileo and the Pope got along together very, very well. Um, but then, but realize that there's several ideas about the solar system floating around out there. And so when he wanted to publish stuff about the heliocentric, the Pope said, good idea, Galileo, but you know, what you really ought to do is write it in a way that kind of presents all of these things as possible hypotheses. Okay. And so what does Galileo actually write? Well, he writes this pamphlet and he does it like a dialogue. And he actually pictures the Pope in the dialogue. And the name of the person in the dialogue is Simpleton. Like, simple-minded. I mean, he's like, this is, you don't do that to the Pope. Um, so the Pope didn't like that. And, and, and he just kept pushing back. And so finally, the Pope had to do something with Galileo. He was going rogue too much. And so he did put him in house arrest. He had a really nice home in Bologna. If you've ever seen pictures of it, Google it. It's a, it was a very nice home. And he was, so it's not like he was in shackles and in prison. He was under house arrest. He was not forbidden from writing. He continued to write extensively. And he was very able to have guests come to his home and talk about things about science. So it's kind of like the Pope had to do something, slap the guy on the wrist, but it was not the oppression that a lot of people make it out to be. But Galileo was amazing. Um, so he's thinking a lot of stuff about, he's pushing a lot back on, on Aristotelian physics. Okay. Um, and he does a lot in terms of experimentation to support his idea. Yeah, Matt. It, it seems skip. to me like there's a Galileo kind of got in trouble mainly because he put out a lot of science and, and, and stuff in a mass form there and his interpretation of that science his mind probably got ahead of him a little bit too fast and he spoke too soon and disseminated that information pretty soon thanks to Gutenberg and the, and the press. Yep. You see a lot of science today they get in trouble because that, that ability to, to get the information out there, the information can get out there faster than science actually. To, to catch up. Oh, no, that's science different. Yeah. Catch up. So yeah. Galileo didn't get in trouble with the church for presenting his science. He got in trouble with, with the church for, said, for the way he did it. It's, and, the, and that information yeah. got out way faster than he could really get it with the science explained. Yeah. Yeah, and actually, and the Jesuits were very warm to his ideas about a heliocentric universe. They were debate, they were really debating between the heliocentric universe of Copernicus and the Tychonic system, 
which is, we won't get into that. So they had already, already dumped Aristotle. They were thinking, they were looking for some other model. So they, they didn't object to that. But here's, here's some things Galileo says. I do not feel obliged to believe that the same God who has endowed us with sense, reason, and intellect has intended us to forego their use and by some other means to give us knowledge which we can attain by them. No. That's what I gave you a mind for. Use it. And he says the laws of nature are written by the hand of God in the language of mathematics, which is always, that's always a very funny and interesting thing, how mathematics makes this connection between our minds and the real world. It's fascinating. Here's one of my heroes. I love this guy, um, Kepler. So he is the one who really kind of straightens out the wrinkles here. Um, because the Copernican system, while it was heliocentric, puts all of the orbits as a perfect circle. And the math just doesn't check out. And which is what's so fascinating is that if, if you use it as a predictive model, Copernicus's model, where the sun is in the center, predicts no better than the Ptolemaic system that had the Earth in the center. How could that be? That's, that's very fascinating. This is why we have these problems with theory selection. But what he figures out is, no, planets are not moving in a perfect circle. They are moving in ellipses. Now, to be fair, if you were to draw it on a piece of paper and show me the elliptical orbit of Mars, let's say, you and I would probably look at it and say, well, it looks like a circle. But it's not quite a circle. And it made all the difference. But here's he says. Uh, now, Kepler, actually, he, was, he went to university to become a Lutheran pastor. That's what he started as. So he was a very devoted, faithful Christian. But he had a real good knack for mathematics. And his professors steered him in that way. But he says... The, the chief aim of all investigations of the external world should be to discover the rational order and harmony which has been imposed on it by God. So he's expecting that, right? And which he revealed to us in the language of mathematics. Gee, didn't we hear that somewhere else? I mean, they, they understand there's this connection here. And he also said this, I was merely thinking God's thoughts after him. Since we astronomers are priests of the highest God in regard to the book of nature, it benefits us to be thoughtful, not of the glory of our minds, but rather above all else of the glory of God. So whatever we do in figuring out science, the end result should be what? Glorifying God. Then we got this guy, good old Isaac Newton, probably one of the smartest guys ever. What does he do? He, he comes up with laws of motion, laws of thermodynamics. He uncovers things about optics, um, law of gravity. Oh, oh, and he invents calculus. Uh, he did that during a pandemic, by the way. Yeah, there were, they had a pandemic, so he went off to the country estate and he just had to twiddle around. Gee, what am I going to do? Oh, I think I'll invent calculus. He didn't have that. So. See, that was the thing, right? So he says this, the most beautiful system, talking about the universe, could only proceed from the dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. He said, the motions which the planets now have could not spring from any natural cause alone, but were impressed by an intelligent agent. He also said something like, if I didn't have any other evidence... If I just had the thumb, that would be enough for me to say there's a God there. If you think about the thumb, and what does it take to do that? That's amazing. Okay, moving on. This guy, Joseph Priestley. Uh, his name is a good indicator of what he did for a living. He was very much a, a theologian. Wrote a lot of, of theological work. But he was also a scientist. He discovers oxygen. It's like, what, you had to discover oxygen? Uh, yeah, because what's out here? This was, this was a great mystery. I mean, I can feel something here, but what's there? 
And so he figures out oxygen, so no small task. Um, he's the guy who, you've probably seen the little experiment with the plant in the bell jar, and then a mouse in the bell jar, and the mouse dies. But then he has a mouse and a plant in the bell jar, and the mouse lives. You ever seen that? So it's this idea that something's coming off the plant. What's coming off the plant? It's oxygen. So he says, when we say there is a God, we mean that there is an intelligent designing cause of what we see in the world around us and a being who was himself uncaused. So that's how he's looking at the world around him. He's saying all of this is here because of intelligent agency. And then here's Michael Faraday. Anyone know what Faraday did? What was his claim to fame? Huh? Well, it's electromagnetism, which is huge. Yeah, a big key. Uh, yeah, a big key, right? <laughs> Anything we do with electronics, power grids, all of that, it goes back to Faraday. The guy was absolutely brilliant. Um, and on the Oxford campus, there is an institute, a Faraday Institute of Christian apologetics. That's where his commitment was. So even though he was a brilliant scientist, he really was about promoting Christian faith. And there's an actual institute at a university in his name for that purpose. So he said, the book of nature which we have to read is written by the finger of God. God has been pleased to work in his material creation by laws. The creator governs his material works by definite laws resulting from the forces impressed on matter. God is at work. Here we got Louis Pasteur, French scientist, microbiologist. He figures out things about germ theory. Uh, that life doesn't just spring about spontaneously. Um, that we have these things called germs. And this first quote here, I think he's really actually echoing something that Francis Bacon said, but he agrees. He's, when people get involved in science and they do it just a little bit, and you get excited about what you can figure out with your own mind, and we think we're pretty smart. Maybe we just didn't need a God after all. But you keep going, and you do a lot of science, and you change your mind. It turns you back to God and realize, mm, no, there has to be a God here. Uh, he said, posterity will one day laugh at the sublime foolishness of the modern materialistic philosophy. He's talking about scientists. The more I study nature, the more I stand amazed at the work of the creator. And he said, I pray while I'm engaged at my work in the laboratory. That's really interesting. <laughs> while he's sit sitting there inoculating bottles with bacteria, he sees that as a time to pray, yeah. yeah I think it's interesting that Pasteur was kind of uh, always struggling against the French government for the, for the ideas they had. And it was the Russians who actually gave him high honor because he um, you know, built that vaccine for the rabies and how he came to the Russia gave him a honor yeah. for, for saving the town. Right. But right. Boy in his own country, yeah, he yeah. He didn't get much accolades. Well, because in the in that French period at that time it was very much enlightenment thinking and to bring God into the picture at all was not favored. James Clerk Maxwell, what did he do? He was a chemist. He was a chemist. He came up with incredible stuff get into it because we're short on time. But he says, I think men of science as well as other men need to learn from Christ. And I think Christians whose minds are scientific are bound to study science that their view of the glory of God may be as extensive as their being is capable. Isn't that interesting? This idea that if, if you have the ability to do science, to have a scientific mind, and you explore what God did in creation that can only serve 
to open up your mind to the greatness of God. That's the effect that it's going to have. Here's Lord Kelvin. He was a physicist. We know him because of the Calvin scale and the temperature, right? Absolute zero. Um, but he was also a, a leader in science in England. He was head of the Royal Academy. Um, and he said this, We only know God in his works, but we are forced by science to admit and to believe with absolute confidence in a directive power in an influence other than physical or dynamic or electrical forces. You understand what he's saying there? Science can't tell us. Our study of nature can't. There's something more here than physical forces. There's something more going on. And when he says, we only know God in his works, that would include his works of scripture. But works of nature alone don't do it for us. And he similarly said, if you study science deep enough and long enough, it will force you to believe in God. There's no other conclusion that you can come to. And Max Planck, Planck's constant, expansion of the universe. He's thinking about big stuff in physics. And he says, while both religion and natural science require a belief in God for their activities. Notice what he's saying there. Science requires a belief in God for their activities. You can't do good science if you don't believe in God. To the former, he is the starting point. To the latter, the goal of every thought process. The same idea of where is your study of nature going to take you to glorify God? That's where it's going to take you. And here's an interesting guy. I had, to, I had to throw him in because he's, he's not wearing this century. Or the, well, the past century, sorry. I'm getting old. George Washington Carver, he, uh, he actually was at my university, Iowa State University, for a time. So I have to hold him up here. He was a very ardent, born-again believer. He had no trouble talking about Jesus. <laughs> None at all. But he said, my, my work, my life must be in the spirit of a little child seeking only to know the truth and follow it. My purpose alone must be God's purpose to increase the welfare and happiness of his people. And here the second quote, he's, he's just talking about how his, his work happened. As I worked on projects will fulfill a real human need, so he's thinking about purposes, were working through me, which amazed me. I would often go to sleep with an apparently insoluble problem. When I woke, the answer was there. Why then should we who believe in Christ be so surprised at what God can do with a willing man in a laboratory? Whereas he is attributing scientific insight to the work of God's Spirit in his life. And he had a good sense of humor. He said, well, I talked to God and, and asked him if he could uncover the world for me and, and un understand the world for me. And God said, that's too big. And so he said, well, God, how about if you just explain the peanut to me? God said, I can do that. Well, real quick, here's what I want to do real quick. So, so we think about, so we have this definite presence of Christian thought and Christian minds in science. And they're doing, the, the, all the guys I put up here made landmark discoveries and really moved us forward in terms of understanding how the world works. But then we get statistics like this. I think this was Pew Research. Um, so here's general public. 83% of the general public say they believe in God. But when we talk to some, when they survey scientists, it's only 33%. Now, I'm always a little skeptical about surveys because you, you know, what was the question that they were asking that made them draw that statistic? But even so, even so, there is quite a bit of disparity there. Um, and here's, you know, 41% were saying they don't believe in God or any kind of spiritual force or anything. So 74%, it looks like they have no faith in any kind of God at all. So we have this preponderance of atheistic people in sciences. 
But then when it comes down to actual discovery and figuring things out, who's, who's really doing that and getting recognized for it? So this is a breakdown of Nobel Prize winners from 1900 to 2000. 65% of the Nobel Prize winners are Christians. And another 21% are Jewish. So 86% of all the Nobel Prizes are going to God believers. And so for all those atheists that we see here, they're not making a splash. People of the book are. And we can, here's another breakdown. This is, here's what the atheists are doing in terms of Nobel Prizes. Their high mark? Literature, not science. 4.7% in physics, 7.1% in chemistry, 9% in physiology, medicine. Here's an interesting one. Only 3.6% 3 get the Peace Prize. Of that, of that 10%, only 3% are getting the Peace Prize. Compare that with, here's Christians. Seventy-eight percent of all of the peace prizes are going to Christians. Hmm. Wonder why that might be. But then look here. Here's chemistry. Seventy-two percent of all the prizes in chemistry are going to Christians. Sixty-five percent are going to physicists. Sixty-two percent are going to people in physiology and in medicine. Hmm. Interesting. Coincidence? Interesting, right? That, that the good thinkers who have a solid basis for their science in a belief in God are able to make more strides in science than unbelievers. Now we have to be careful there. That's not to saying if you're an atheist you can't do anything in science. This is averages, right? But it's, this is more than just coincidence. We're, we're, put, we're bucking the odds here, aren't we? If only 33% of scientists are God believers, and yet we're doubling that here. Interesting. Yeah, Mark? Well, I've got a favorite quote from the Werner Heisenberg. Is quantum physics. Yeah. He says the first drink from the cup of natural science makes one of the things. But at the bottom of the glass it comes. Right. 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 Yeah. You press it long enough and it becomes very, very clear that, that God is in the mix here. So. All right, any other final thoughts, questions before we cut out of here? All right, so next week, we're going to just do some fun stuff. Um, next week, I'm going to share with you the presentation that I gave at the Mines campus a couple weeks ago. We're going to look at mosquitoes. But it has some interesting things to think about. Um, I think it really should challenge us in the way we think about things like intelligent design, how we explain what's going on in the world. It, there's some really, I mean, it's, it'll be kind of fun, but there's also some really, really serious philosophical questions that we're going to have to grapple with when we think about that. So that's next week. All right? Let's close in a word of prayer. God, we do thank you um, that you have given us minds that have the ability to look at the world you created a world that is understandable for us and that we can understand it with our minds. And in so doing, it's a reflection on you and your greatness and your goodness and your glory. And so as we go to worship you now, help us to continue to do that, to give you praise and honor and glory 
that you deserve for all of your works, not just in creation, but in our lives. So we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.